should be um, streaming. Um, I'm going to do a, um, chapter four of Panpara today, um, after which point I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I may end up doing um, some blind specific games um, for a slight change. Um, and yeah, I mean, people can feel free to um, hang out for that or not. Uh, no worries either way. But I think that's what I will do. So um, let's get started with Pompara because I actually did remember to um, get all the correct chat pages and stuff where they need to go before we started. So, okay. <clears throat> so chapter four. Um, or no, I'm sorry. This is chapter three. I don't know why I've been saying four. Uh, we are on chapter three. Um, chapter four is the last of the chapters that I played through, so I guess I thought we were closer to finishing that, but um, we are not. So. Um, okay, so when we last sort of um, played chapter two, um, our character was basically. Um, so we found out that they had a really rocky relationship with the town's priest, um, whose name is Ermish. And uh, we don't really respect Ermish because the spells that he is supposed to have been gifted, um, you know, in the relationship with his god, he doesn't have any power. Um, and we don't really know why, uh, but he's basically entitled to all of the privileges of rank that come with a priest's work and none of the um, work that they are supposed to do in uh, return. Um, the trolls attacked um, our like village while we were having this confrontation um, and stole a bunch of things. They did not seem super bent on murder as such, more like raiding and killing, and, uh, or sorry, more like a stealing and um, inadvertent killings or, or killings by necessity almost, um, rather than just like going out and, and speci specifically uh, seeking to kill as many people as possible. So. <laughs> um, we went after Nathia, who was, um, I think she was the shipwright's daughter. She was one of the daughters of one of the people in the, in the village. Uh, but unfortunately, she was killed because we uh, decided to take on the troll. Um, our trolls, rather. Multiples of them. Uh, and did not fare as well as we would, we would have liked. We survived, but she did not. Uh, then we basically castigated Ermish in front of our town for doing nothing. Um, and uh, our mother was actually proud of the fact that we did something. So now this is chapter three. And we basically are back in a weird tunnel cave thing. And uh, we don't know how we got here or why we are here. So that is where we are picking up today. Uh, the YouTube stream for um, chapter two is not up yet. Uh, I need to figure out how to trim the end of that video that was basically just just my desktop. Um, uh, didn't mean to do that, but I did. So got to figure out how to how to trim that, and then I can upload that. Okay, chapter three, the hooded man. In the darkness of the tunnel, you do what your parents trained you to do. Take inventory. Um, oh, some of the dots on my braille display are not working. Yes. Uh, you do what your parents taught you to do. Um, you take inventory. In one hand, a plain bronze sword. In the other, a little clay lamp, half full with oil, casting a dim light. Your sleeping tunic. Your shroud. Thank Amiria that even sleepwalking, you remember that. And nothing else. 
Your bare feet feel cold on the tunnel's earthen floor. There is a pressure on your mind, different uh, from the weight of the earth. It feels like when Ermish makes the sign of Yoon, but there is power behind it. You <clears throat> remember you remember the salt streaked idols beneath the unfinished temples. But then the eerie sensation fades, and practical worries once again assail you. The tunnel is roughly circular, made of mixed earth and stone, and slopes slightly downward in one direction. It's tall enough that you must reach up to touch uh, the ceiling, and you're grateful you don't have to uh, crouch. A faint cool wind blows up from uh, down slope. Concentrating, um, you hear an arrhythmic sound up, uh, up slope, perhaps the drip of water. So here is we have our choices here are the um, cold draft might be fresh air. I follow it looking for um, roots or other natural signs that I'm close to the surface. I head up to the towards the sound of water um, even if I have to risk an exhausting climb. My lamp is half full. I stay here, nimbly, uh, nimbly nursing the oil of with my crafting skill to keep it lit until someone finds me. Some god or demon led me down here. I look for any signs of why I'm here. Or unless the gods flew me in, I should have left. Or I ought to have left footprints. Um, I look for, uh, I look for any sign of them. Um, I mean, I don't know a ton about caves. I, I'm pretty sure that I have heard that like drafts are not necessarily a sign of um, air, just because of how like twisty they are. Uh, water may be similar, but also is still a resource. Um, I think this definitely feels supernatural, so we're going to assume the gods flew us in, but still look for practical signs, uh, footprints and such. So that's what we're going to do. Ah, indeed, there are imp imprints of your bare feet in the hard earth. But they seem to go in both directions, as if you were wandering in dreams for a long time before you awoke. You follow them down the tunnel to a fork, then up the tunnel to a steep climb. They go everywhere, and then, kneeling closely, you notice other footprints. Or you discover other footprints. Smaller and clawed. Trolls. Alright, well. That should have gone better. Or I would have, I hoped that would have gone better. Your lamp gutters low as you return to where you started. Uh, and we have the same options. Um, I'm still pretty convinced this is supernatural, so it's probably not super wise, but I kind of want to see what happens. So we're going to look for symbols of why we are down here. You look for runes or symbols in the walls, uh, listen for voices on the wind, even try to catch a smell of incense on the air, but there's nothing. Perhaps you don't know what to look for, or perhaps what the fight with the, perhaps the fight with the trolls has addled you, and you uh, sleepwalked, sleepwalked, yeah, you sleepwalked, sleepwalked into the darkness. Alright, then 
we are going to go towards the water. You head up the tunnel, your little clay lamp leading, leading the way until hard stone replaces the dirt beneath your feet. In moments, you encounter your first serious obstacle. A scramble of broken rocks that leads to a water streaked. Uh, oh, it leads up to a water streaked vertical wall, twice your height. Even under better circumstances, that climb might daunt you. But with a sword in one hand and a lamp in the other, it looks impossible. You find a niche in the rock face that can hold uh, your lamp and wedge it in there, then start to climb one-handed. You haul yourself halfway up, wedge your sword in the, in the crook of your elbow, and uh, reach for the ledge above. You can almost reach. And then your lamp falls out um, of its niche and breaks, plunging you instantly into darkness. You haul yourself up the ledge, but you can see nothing, not even the sword in front of your face. A few moments later, you hear the trolls. Ah, oh. okay. Well, surely we can't die this early. Hopefully. They are whispering and arguing in their guttural language. But, more importantly, they have light. That tiny light is a beacon in the utter darkness of the tunnel, and you follow it to a crack between the floor and the wall, just wide enough to squeeze through. The trolls are below you. Peering, uh, peering through it, you see an underground river, not wide, but big enough for a small uh, coracle, which we for, for the little boats that they have. Okay. Um, currently riding low in the water as it's full of stolen pine tribe valuables. Three trolls stand around the coracle, arguing about the boat. One troll has a candle between um, between his horns. <laughs> That's very practical, but also seems like it would be very comical. Um, the wax has melted into his fur. Uh, and streaked his face. All three have uh, bronze knives stolen from the town above. So could I try reasoning with them? Do they speak our Borg? Though I'm outnumbered, I can't let these robbers escape. I rush Nathia's killers with my sword and hit them with all my uh, strength. Well, our strength is not good, so that would be a bad option. I jump onto their boat, hoping I'm smart enough to understand troll knots uh, and use my mariner training to escape. Is there any other way out of the, the this room or is it just the crack in the river so we can take a moment to take a better look? I think she um, probably just wants to get out of there and sees a solution that might work for her, so she's going to do 
that and try to um, take steal the boat. Probably will not work with all of them there, but um, it would be funny if it did, so we're going to try it. You drop through a crack and run for the boat. You're on it before the trolls can react, but uh, the elaborate knots holding it fast prove unexpectedly complicated. Fortunately, good bronze beats good knots, and you shear through the line with your sword. All right. So, rock, paper, sword, or something. Um, but the sight of your sword uh, terrifies and enrages the trolls. They leap into the corporal and the overladen little boat slides sideways. Uh, knocking all four of you into the water. Your lamp vanishes and the icy water shocks you. The troll, um, the troll with the candle on his head desperately writes himself um, as his flame gutters, but the other two grab you and haul you back onto the beach. The candle head seizes your sword. Another tries uh, to retrieve the boat, but it drifts out of reach. Okay, well, at least we, we took their boat. I mean, they can't use it, we can't either, but at least they can't use it. Uh, I mean, at least for now. Not great, but still, it's okay. A third moves to tie you up with rope he, or, oh, with the rope you just cut through. Well. It occurs to you that despite the cold uh, numbing your limbs, you might have a chance of uh, overpowering your would-be captors. But then you see more trolls moving their way, or shoving their way in, uh, in the crack in the wall. In seconds, uh, a dozen trolls flood the little chamber. They must have detected you earlier, and now they have you. Oh, well, lovely. Then a new figure drops into the chamber right in front of the trolls, or right in the middle of the trolls. You catch the bronze gleam of a spear as it punches through one of the candle heads. The creatures waver, some dropping their weapons, and you see your chance. You slash the nearest troll's hand, knocking him into his fellow. Fellows, sorry. This new attacker keeps away from you, fighting with their back to the wall, even as you get away from the river. The trolls are so numerous, they could still probably overwhelm you, but instead they panic and flee. Some rush for the crack in the wall, while others uh, jump in the coracle and cast off. Oh, so they kept their bow too. Well. <laughs> yeah. You count five corpses, two of whom are candle heads whose lights still provide some illumination. That's that's morbid. The new figure studies you, keeping to the shadows. Good evening. A woman's voice, low and strange, strangely accented, whispery as though from strong, uh, long silence. You're not who I was looking for. The pressure returns upon your mind, an alien force. Is this what has driven the trolls mad? Does a goddess stand before you? You look for the signs of fire of Amiria. Uh, oh, my bad. No, you look for the signs of Phi Amiria or Mithy. But then you realize that the woman is a nymph, radiant and long limbed, long limbed with a moon pale face, surrounded by short hair, the color of summer skies. She leans against a winged spear with a pole of hard ash and seems both irritated and bewildered by everything around her, including you. You've never met a nymph before, and though you know enough of the strange immortals to be cautious, her mannerisms are not threatening. 
She prods a dead troll with her spear. Thank you for your help. Those trolls almost had me. Do you know how to get out of here? I try to remember how to address a nymph in the proper manner. I'm Maya Bell. Are you from here? I need to take charge before this situation gets worse. Thank you. Watch my back for anything that will help. Watch my back while I look for anything that will help get us out of here. Or, well, I'm the one you found, so either help me or step us help me get out of here or step aside. Um. Yeah, we probably shouldn't be rude to her. Uh, she might seem she seems definitely more important than we are at the moment, um, and more knowledgeable. So let's. Um, I don't feel like she would just admit that she was as close to death as she definitely was either, so we will say, I try to remember how to address a nymph in the proper manner. I am Maya Bell, are you from here? You mean this dirty troll pit in particular? No, I have a house above. She blinks, had a house. Which reminds me, I need to find someone and ask him why he destroyed my work. What sort of work do you do? I'm the chieftain's child in Hedge. We need to focus on getting out of here. Revenge can wait. We still haven't been properly introduced. As you know, I am Maya Bell, and you are... I think she's really kind of still curious, even in the midst of all this. What kind of work do you do? I'm a philosopher, the nymph says. I'm Elaxu. Or. Malaxu? M E L A X U. Malaxu. Yeah, let's go with Malaxu. I like it better than Malaxu. Malaxu just has like a weird ah. It sounds like the ah, like the. I don't like that. Uh. That was a weird tangent. Um. Anyway. She waits as though expecting you to have heard of her. Then she sighs. I suppose everyone I once knew is dead. Anyway, a man in a brown hooded cape burned my scrolls and destroyed my work. I believe the trolls serve him. Unfortunately, nymphs were not milt, built for life underground. I must return to the surface and consider my approach. Why are you here anyway? I think the gods spoke to me and told me to come here. The trolls attach he attacked hedged hedge. I need to... I... Oh my goodness. The trolls attacked, attacked Hetch. I'm here to deal with them. My mother wanted me to scout the troll tunnel. It's surprising she never mentioned you. Um, yeah, we're going to go with the third option here. You should have asked her about my grandmother, Malaxu says absently. They fought together once. Is there anyone that her mother hasn't fought with? Well, I mean, other than Haritha, presumably. Uh, well, no, we don't. I get. I mean, maybe she was like on the good side before she like went evil. We don't know. Uh, I wonder how many trolls they killed back when the trolls swore themselves to Haritha. In those days, they practiced cannibalism as a sacrament to honor Akamen, the god of destruction. Now I think they do it because they have become beasts. Oh, did you not know? If you died here, they will eat you. They have been eating each other. Ah, well, that's charming. That's, uh, let's find a way out of here. I love how nonchalant she is. If you die in this dream, you die in real life. They will eat you. That's cool. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I guess she's actually not dreaming. Because uh, this seems like not a dream. She actually, I guess, did just sleepwalk down here. Weird. Um, I thought this was the place where a certain definitely mystical thing happens, but I guess it is not. Um, or, or, or it is and I did made the choices wrong this time? I don't remember. I don't know. Uh, or maybe it's the next chapter. Either way. While she talks, Malaksu grabs a dripping candle from one of the dead trolls and uses it to light a piece of moss-covered, soggy-looking wood. Somehow it catches 
blazing with a clean green gold flame. For a moment, you think you see something moving inside the wood, but you cannot look directly into the fire. The nymph wears a small, a wide sky blue shawl tucked into a belt. A white tunic fastened with an ivory fibula that falls to mid knee and plain sandals. Everything is exceptionally craft crafted, but not in the style of your tribe. Footsteps echo from somewhere, but you cannot tell from where. They'll find us, Malaxu says, handing you the mossy torch. We're leaving. She navigates you back to the tunnel where you awoke. Together, you make your way upslope. Two people have no difficulty surmounting the rock face, and in moments you can smell pine and s see dangling roots. The unworked stone gives way to signs of more recent excavation. You're in the old tin mine, exhausted and abandoned some time before your family arrived. The pressure on your mind retreats. Perhaps dark gods sought you for their own purposes down here. If so, they seem to be losing their hold on your soul. Um, well, that's ominous. I mean, that doesn't, I mean, I think we would have, I hope we would have gotten more of a bad feeling than like, that's kind of like that thing our priest does. Uh, I would hope, but I, I mean, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but then you hear more trolls, their excited voices echoing off the rocks and support beams. The two of you wait in silence until their footsteps, footsteps fade. The nymph looks terrified as though she might flee into the darkness at any moment in a desperate attempt to reach the surface, though it might just be the torch's green light making her look sickly. I ask Malaxu about philosophy, hoping that I know enough about normal crafts not to sound foolish. Malaxu is a scholar. I will impress her with my charm and broad-ranging broad knowledge. The nymph obviously hates being underground. I study my nerves and sneak her past the trolls. Um, it would be good to make a good impression here. I, I, uh, let me see if I have any inkling what our stealth is. Uh, hey, well, even if we do, would we be able to sneak her past? Because she's, like, tall and stuff. And presumably a little bit less fleet than us. We'll see. Um, our grace is unmatched, Mary. Our might, uh... Yeah, so our grace is renowned, and it says grace is used for balance, leaping, throwing, shooting, dodging, and dodging. Uh, and I don't see anything else that looks more like it would correlate to stealth, so let's try that. You have many questions for the philosopher, but they will have to wait. You hand the torch back to Malaksu and out ahead, ignoring your instinctive fear of the dark and the earth, or and the weight placing, pre the weight pressing down from above. Troll voices and flapping troll feet echo from every direction, but you move with silence and patience. They're directly ahead. You fall back, wave Malaxu forward, then you wait. Soon the voices pass. There must have been twenty of them swarming down the cave ahead, but they're gone now. She hands the torch back. Uh, she hands the torch back. These wretched creatures, Malaxu said. Says. She tugs on a root overhead, looking for a way up to the surface, which is now only a few cubits above you. Something has driven the trolls mad, or someone. I have never seen the man with the brown hood before, but perhaps he did this. Though why he destroyed my work and my servants, I do not know. The nymph's hand tightened on her spear. You notice that spider webs cling to the uh, 
ashen haft here and there where blood troll's blood has not stained it and wonder how long Malaksu was lost in her work. It may annoy Malaksu, but I dig for religious lore. Our town's priest said that storm raiders and their dark priest um, and our, their dark priests be responsible for the trolls. I'm sorry about your work. I raise their, my sword and try to look like a determined warrior. I won't let the trolls get away with it. We need to focus on getting out. Let's focus until or climb until we. Let's run until we find some way to climb to the surface. Um, let's do the second one, I think. <clears throat> Malaksu laughs. Oh, wait, you're serious? She looks you up and down, then laughs again. Yeah, well, we're not very good at being a warrior, but for some reason we are determined to keep trying. I don't know why. She just has this weird thing about it. Um, the tunnel forces you to descend and you lose the moonlight, but then the walls grow straight and regular, braced by old timbers. Soon you see an irregular patch of starlight ahead. The entrance or in, in your case, the exit to the old tin mine. Malaksu rushes, rushes ahead to breathe the fresh air. Following, you find yourself above hedge on a low slope covered in ancient um, and gnarled yews, so twisted that the pine tribe's woodcutters have ignored them. Moonlight illuminates the bronze spear tips and boar tusk helmets of the redoubled guards arrayed atop Hedge's defensive wall. Para is right to set a heavy guard, as Hedge's wall is nothing but a raised circle of grass Sorry, that encircles the middle, middle of town and that serves as a grazing commons for sheep. More guards wander the new town beyond the hall. Or, uh, I'm sorry. More... <laughs> More guards wander the new town beyond the wall in groups of four. By the bee, what happened to the village? Malaksu gasps, reclaiming the torch and extinguishing it with a flick of her wrist. There used to be fewer than 200 people down there. Looking down on the hundreds uh, of townhouses, you wonder, uh, not for the first time, how old the nymph is. So we know from um, our last play, our last chapter, that um, Phi is one of their gods who is uh, um, basically also a god of craftsmanship, um, and that he has a beard. All of the gods have different um, animals that are associated with them that are sacred to them, and Phi's is um, bees because he has a beard of bees, which I am still, I think, is incredibly disturbing to me personally, but cool. Um, Apparently he is on the good side. I don't know about this beard of bees, though. So, Ponpara. It's Grompit just in front of you. Yay, Grompit! Oh, he's not dead. I was pretty sure he was dead. I don't know why he would have been dead, because we didn't see him die, but I, I don't know. Or at least insane. Incredibly insane. I definitely thought he was dead. Um, but he seems to not be, or at least not yet. So, Panpara, it's Grumpet just in front of you. He holds a copper axe. More trolls hide in the moon shadows cast by the gnarled trees. You can almost smell their madness now, like a stink, the stink of a passing bear that drives dogs to frenzy and howling. They gibber to one another, something not quite language. A few skulk through the pine needles on all fours. You instinctively flinch away from that madness as it may infect you because you know it is no mere disease or mass lunacy. Something godlike lurks in the minds of the trolls and you fear it has touched you as well. Defilers. 
Malafsu Mil- whispers. Knuckles white on the ash haft of her st- ash handle of her st- spear. She seems ready to rush them like a wild boar, so great is her fury. You might be able to fight your way through the trolls and reach the old town walls. Or wall, sorry. But though the nymph wants blood, you wonder if there is still some way to reach Grompit, despite everything he has done. I try to reason with Grompit, drawing myself up to my full height, speaking courteously and diplomatically. I have studied the traditional customs of the trolls, and I follow... I fearlessly approach Grompit, hoping my scholastic knowledge of trolls can calm him. We need to attack, but we can't af- We can't fight them all. I hit fast, then we run. Um, I think she... I hate to do this, because I know what happens when you do this. I've played through this chapter a little bit. Um... I think she reasons with him. She tries to reason with him because, again, we've established that she sees them as more equals um, than they uh, necessarily are. So, Grompit, you say. Do you remember when we used to explore these hills together? What are you doing, human? Malaxu snaps. We explored, Grompit says. We looked at, what did we see? The mosaics, Grompit, you say, trying to reach him. But then a troll hur- hurls a stone at your head. Malaxu glides forward and strikes it from the air with her spear, then swings her weapon like a broom, knocking that troll into two others. Run for the village, the nymph says. The trolls... Run for the village, the nymph says. The troll trolls try to regroup, but Grompit is st- stumbling through them like a drunkard, con- confusing and disrupting them as, they, as he rants. You parry a hesitant spear thrust with your sword. Then you and Malaxu are running for the town wall. Farms and pasture land, divided by windbreaks of low trees, separate the woods around the old tin mine from the first buildings of the rapidly expanding town of Hetch. The patchwork is hard to navigate by moonlight, especially because of the unfinished irrigation dishes. But you've explored Hetch all your life, and soon you have outpaced the trolls. In moments, you and Malaxu have passed the half-finished public house intended for travelers' lodging and reached the old wall's gate. Nothing remains of any actual gate. You and the nymph stand before a gap in the grassy hill flanked by an idol of Yoon on one side and a small wooden guard tower to the other. You stop to catch your breath. Beside you, Malaxu shivers. Sweat has plastered her short blue hair to her forehead. I have never actually used this, she says, rattling her blood-stained spear. It works more or less as I expected it would, but still. Well, that's comforting. At least she can, like, pretend she knows what she's doing long enough to, like, terrify the, the trolls, I guess. The archers in the tower finally notice you standing right there in the entrance to Hedge. Mayabel, the guide shout, or guard shouts. He slides down the guard t- guard tower's ladder. Finally, you step forward to speak to whoever is coming down to greet you. And then, like in the pit of the new temple, the ground gives out beneath your feet. You fall, grabbing blindly at roots. You manage to snag one, and for a second, as dirt pours across your shoulders, you older open one shoulder. I cannot read while my screen reader is reading to me, and I read Braille too slowly to... Okay, this is frustrating. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's going to happen. Some days are just going to be better for reading quickly, and some days are not. And this is unfortunately not, so... Let's see. Uh, and then, like in the pit of the new temple, the ground gives out beneath your feet. You fall, grabbing blindly at roots. You manage to snag one, and for a second, as Dort pours across your shoulders, you open one eye and see beneath the old gate. Long ago, the people of Hedge offered sacrifices to protect their home. You see the jumbled bones of deer, elk, cattle. Is that a human skull? And then the gods in the earth rush in to claim you.
The gods again. You remember the salt-streaked idols beneath the unfinished temples. But those were the heavenly gods whose, whose wisdom helped the world survive its near destruction at the hands of Ackerman. The powers that swirl around you as you tumble through a nexus of darkness assail your thoughts, tear at your flesh. The dark gods have come, come for you as they came for the trolls. They are pulling you apart. You force yourself to imagine the forgotten idols beneath the earth, and they seem to appear around you in the void. Their light rushes into the darkness like hounds charging fearlessly among wolves, scattering the black winds. Coils of light and darkness wrap around one another, serpents locked in death grips. But three fight past the hurricane of, um, of darkness and reach out to you. They dig into your flesh and soul, as painful as the dark gods. It is a pure, clean pain, but you realize that you must choose lest heaven's demands rip you apart. Something has gone disastrously wrong above and beneath the earth, if the bright gods have taken an interest in you. They re needed a disciple, you realize. Someone to wield their signs, and only one of them can, only one of them can have you. Your mother's god, and the patron of the pine tribe, Yoon, is the god of creation and crafts. He offers you the sign of creation to call forth objects from nothingness. Your father's goddess and the patron of all of the northern forests, Phi, is the goddess of life and healing. She offers you the sign of life, healing, strength of limb, command over all things that grow. Then, unexpectedly, a third power pulls upon your soul. Amiria, the goddess of love and music, Mistress of beauty, beauty, mistress of beauty, who promises you the sign of illusions, the power to call forth the unreal. Um, I think we have established that she has um is intrigued by Amiria before now, uh, because of some of her father's story stories and specifically the thievery. Um. But we are also a, a pretty well-established craftsperson, um, so I feel like Yoon would also be a good fit. Phi um, is the goddess of life and healing who offers us the sign of healing. I don't feel like that fits this character, although it would be interesting, I think, to do a playthrough of that at some point. So that basically leaves... Um, Yoon <coughs> and Amiria. So we could. I choose Yoon. To me, he is the god of kings of god. Uh, the. To me, he is the god of kings and king of gods, lord of justice and wrath, warrior smith of my mother Para. Or, I choose Yoon. To me, he is the god of crafts and inventions, master of sciences and secret methods. I choose Phi, who represents the green and living world, a queen of hunters and keeper of the old ways. I choose Phi, who represents healing and peacemaking, a lady of wise counsel and honest words. I choose Amiria, goddess of love and illusion, elegance and grace. Or I choose Amelia, Amiria, goddess of trickery, illusions, swindles, and the occasional theft. Yeah, I think we're gonna go Amiria on this on this playthrough. We may do Yoon on a different playthrough. Um, and there's no one here in the chat, or I would ask if people had preferences for which through we do I actually may pause here because this is an important um, decision and I think I think other people might be other you know if I'm going to be continuing this playthrough I want people to enjoy it so if people want to make um, their preferences known then that would be good I think it would not really make sense for us to do um, to do the the healer goddess at this point but 
So that basically leaves Fi and Amiria for two different reasons each. Um, so yeah, if you have a preference, let me know which god and which reason. Otherwise, I will probably go for the last one. Until next time.